Um, just before I start, can I just get a feel for who's here? How many of you have some kind of uh, information technology uh, role in your organisations? You just give me a... Uh -huh, so that's most of you. Okay, are there any councillors here? Are there any CEOs? Are there any strategy managers? Oh, good. Okay, that's excellent. Look, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank uh, MAV for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm not an uh, internet uh, technology expert, I'm actually a, a user. But what I hope to be able to do today is to share with you, um, uh, in a very brief manner, the kind of context for change. Because uh, humans uh, really don't like changing unless they're hardwired to do so. Um, and so I want to just explore some of that. Um, this, by the way, is a, a series of photos by a, a marvellous photographer called uh, Steve McCurry. And McCurry uh, got the last roll of um, Kodachrome film, which had been produced for 75 years. And these were the photos, uh, or some of them, that he took with that film. And the point I want to make is that, in fact, nothing lasts forever. So. The institutions of local governments, the processes and the systems, in fact, that you've developed won't last forever. Sooner or later they have to change. And it's worthy of note that Eastman Kodak, now in bankruptcy, invented the digital camera. So just because you know about IT, please don't think that that means that you've got a role similar to what you've got now in the future of the cloud. The second thing I want to say to you is, in fact, that the things I want to talk about early on today, and some of you might have heard this from me before, um, is in fact a fundamental reshaping of form and space. And the cloud, as you will, uh, as, as you will see today, I think, is one of the things that is a pointer, a signal, to this reshaping of form and space. If you walk outside these doors, or in your local community, wherever that might happen to be, you can see, if you like, a historical record in front of you of what was important to the people of those times. So in the 19th century, places like the Gold Museum, across the road here, defined Melbourne. They told us what kind of city it was. And the second photo there that you see is actually the Fairfax printing press at Tullamarine. And how was it that 10 years ago, armed with the kind of knowledge that you've got now, a group of very well-educated directors who do everything correctly managed to build a new printing press in the old model? And I just wonder what the Fairfax project in your council is. And I bet you've got one. And some of you might be managing it. <coughs> and what I'm interested in is actually what is the form and shape of the 21st century? So in front of us we are seeing things, for example, like retail being reshaped in front of our eyes. And what you see in your communities is empty shops. Why is that? Sorry for you, for those of you who uh, have heard this before, but I think it's significant. Because in my view, if you don't understand this, then cloud becomes nice to do, not necessary to do. Um, some 20,000 years ago, uh, we saw people aggregate into small states, places like Samaria. And they did so because, in fact, they had access to a new form of energy in the form of horses, slaves, um, camels, donkeys, or whatever. In fact, we still use the term horsepower. It's pretty interesting. And one of the things that they did was, as they started to cultivate crops, was that they had to start to count things. And so they invented writing. And I think it's important that what you start to see is that these great civilizations of the past, the great hydraulic civilizations, were in fact premised on two changes, and that was around energy and communications. 200 years ago, that changed again. And we shifted from those very small city states and, uh, and, 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 and 
um, and, and uh, rural countryside into factory-based cities. And of course, the energy systems changed into steam and into printing, which was a convergence of the uh, printing press and cheap linotype. In fact, the reason why people like you and I have an education is because of this revolution. Up until then, ordinary people did not have access to this kind of knowledge. So, so printing democratised knowledge at an astonishing rate. The working class has got uppity. What most people don't talk about, and this is the one that, in fact, you're hardwired into, is, in fact, that 100 years ago there was another revolution. We shifted from factories to suburbs. And we shifted from steam to oil and electricity, which as technologies had vast more uh, output and efficiencies than, than steam. And the communications that mattered were telephony and early, uh, and early media, picture-driven media. And that, I would argue, by the way, extended all the way through the 20th century, including early digital. And all the processes and all the things that your local government do, generally speaking, are based on this revolution. What a number of people are arguing, and I am among them, is that, in fact, we are now in the middle of an... But I'll go back. When this occurred, the monarchs of the world disappeared. We saw changes in built form. We saw things like mechanic societies emerge. And you probably might even have a mechanics hall down your local street. And when this change started to occur, it didn't matter who was in power. You know, the kind of revolution that this brought about wasn't a choice. These things happen. And I'm going to argue we're in the middle of a new one. What we'll start to see very quickly is your suburbs and industrial states reform into interconnected villages. And by the way, the rough rule of thumb of a, of a village is about as far as you can walk in an hour and a half. <coughs> and the distributed energies will shift the power away from the providers to the consumers, and every building will become its own power plant. Every vehicle will become its own power plant. And they will all be connected together, and already we're starting to see the beginnings of that system, despite the protestations of the large utilities. And the social networking technologies, and I distinguish them from IT, this ability to communicate from one to many in any configuration that you care to think of is truly revolutionary in the same way that printing and writing were before. That's the shift that is on. And the question is, will your council be a bystander or will it be an enabler? I've already made the point, you don't actually have a choice. Just need to keep an eye on the time. I want to make the point to start with is that, and I'm, I'm not going to rehearse this, you've all heard this ad nauseum, but the reality is there are a whole range of large environmental systems out there that in fact have suffered considerably because one of the consequences of that oil and elect electricity revolution was we were able to access resources in the way we always had done, but in a much, much more efficient manner. In fact, we became so good at it, we've actually exhausted a number of things. Surface-based coal would be an example. And the large environmental systems on the planet right now are beginning to push back. The effects of, in fact, moving energy from being useful to useless, which is called entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, in fact, is now starting to have its consequences. And if you believe in science and rationality, and frankly, if you're an IT, I can't see that you've really got an option, then you should be very worried. Maybe not for yourself, but certainly for your children and your grandchildren. By the way, I have a view that my grandchildren, if I ever get any, will curse me. They will curse me because when you look at the scenarios for 2060, they're horrible. 
They are truly horrible. The World Bank, in a recent report, hardly a radical organisation, by the way, has actually said that we're going to be in four degrees warming by 2060. That's about two degrees higher than what is generally accepted as being the outer limit of comfortable human habitation. And what they're arguing, and it's really worth reading, is that in fact that that future is so different and the disruptions are so profound, it's really hard to even plan for it. I hope we don't get there. But on the current uh, settings, I'm reasonably sure that we will. And if we do get to a point where we try to constrain things, and there are lots and lots of arguments as to why we should, by the way, we could talk equally about soil and water, then in fact the International Energy Agency, you know, that's the radical organisation that you know, Shell, BP, you know, Saudi Arabia and a few others support, um, has actually said that of the proven fossil fuel reserves we've got in the ground, we cannot in fact commercialise two thirds of them if we're to stay below two degrees. So here's the issue. We've been really, really successful up until now, but the basis on which we've done things is going to have to change. That's, that's, that's the challenge. And it's not something you can put off until you know, 2020 or 2030. If we don't start doing some of these things now, basically by 2025, it will be hardwired into the system anyway. And where the real money's going right now, the serious money globally, by the way, people like in GE would be saying to me right now, get on with it, Mike, we know all this stuff. We've been having this as part of our plans for the last 10 years. So would IBM and so would a whole lot of other radical organisations. You notice I talk about all these terrorist organisations like GE and IBM all the time. What, what this means, what this... What this fundamentally means is that, in fact, we can, in fact, build ways of doing things where right now we can use half resources to create double the value. Half the resources to create double the value. And the really smart business models are using about a tenth of the resources to create double the value. So a tenth of the resources to create the same value. So either half the resources double the value or a tenth of the resources same value. And so what you see around you right now are people developing business models, new ways of doing things, using a fraction of the resources to create the same or more value. And I think that councils have got a key role in the renaissance of their communities along these sorts of models. And it is that message of hope, now I've had you all running for the trees, that I want to talk about for the rest of the time that I'm doing this. This world of the interconnected village, the network revolution, changes pretty much everything that we do. You see, in the, in, the, in the age of steam, we invented a thing called capitalism. It didn't really exist before then. And cap what capitalism was, was you took some money and you bought a machine that you could then get other people to work so you could make some money. And this was a novel idea. That's actually how capitalism, as we understand it, started. And by the way, the first capitalist, including Adam Smith, who was an economist that everybody likes to quote, they lived in the world where they believed that the world was a clock. It was called Newtonian physics. The world was ordered like a big clock. And all we had to do was understand the clock. And that's why we have nice little rules like the supply and demand in markets. But there is no evidence that that's ever been true, by the way. I've got a great book at home called The Great Wave, and it's written by a man called Fisher, who has a series of price waves going right back to about the year 100, you know, selling tulips or barley or goats or God knows what else. And there have been, you know, major price rises based on the price of goats in the past. And what he found was, in fact, that when you look at all of these uh, price waves, two things happen. One, they all come down. Um, two, that there is no evidence that supply and demand has got anything to do with the way they go up and the way they come down. Ever. And three, that there seems to be increases in population either just before or just after, but
but he's not sure why. And that is all you can get from, so there's, there's the end of the uh, economics lesson, and that is all we can learn from history. But I want to come back and look in fact what this world of the cloud does, and you'll see I've extended it beyond the kinds of things that you will be hearing for the rest of the day. But I want to create the context. The first thing is, in the 20th century, the model of business, of organisation, of delivery, including government, were larger aggregations of things, centralised control, supervisors, managers and their secretaries. Remember them? That's not true anymore. The model of the future will be small-scale connected nodes of things because the cost of inf information transfer, as you all know, has gone to nothing. And so what we'll see is a profound sh change, and we already are, in what constitutes an organisation. There may come a time when we won't need performance management anymore. Or all those other things, you know, equal opportunity meetings and stuff. <coughs> so you need those in that centralised model because there's all these filters. In a network world, you don't. Because in the network world, creativity, as you know, follows value. The third one which is really important, is, and I've already uh, signalled this, is we are rapidly moving from supply-side models, I will tell you what's good for you, this is the amount of electricity that you can have, and if you dare to produce renewables, I will buy them back from you, to consumption-based models. By the way, in the US, there's a little firm right now producing a, a nice little uh, device which you can hook into any solar panel. You can drill a hole on the side of your wall. You can plug it into the nearest three-pin plug. And the first thing it will do is it will draw down all of that power and supply your house as a first option. And should you start to run out, it will then interrogate the meter and draw down um, power from the, from the outside. Um, that's the future that the utilities don't want you to talk about. The other thing that occurs in this world where we've got this distributed model is that we move from a, a, a world of competitiveness to a world of collaboration. By the world, another radical organisation I'm very fond of, the World Economic Forum, in fact has for the last three years had in its banner headline, the new competition is collaboration. And I think the discussion that you're going to start to have today is an opportunity for all of you to talk about the kinds of collaborations you have never thought of. And if you get it right, it will reframe your councils. And finally, I don't know what happened then. Something went wrong. Oh, is that you, is it? No. The lights have gone out, huh? Sorry, God. Um, and finally, but uh, by no means least, we're going to see, obviously, the rapid growth in business models that use far fewer resources than indeed we already are. Since this is a very technology literate audience, I don't want to uh, push this in any way, but the point I want to make here is cloud, in my view, is just one piece of the technology platform that underpins this network society that I'm talking about. And the other three are clearly the increase in bandwidth. I'll talk about that again in a moment. Um, geospatial, which I think is the, uh, the piece that uh, even a lot of IT people have not got their heads around. And of course, mobile devices. And what I think that the uh, impact of this technology platform is, is simply that in fact, right now, Nothing that you can think of is about technology. It's actually about designing the right solutions. So please, as you start to look at this cloud computing stuff today, think about what the solutions might be for your council, not about the technologies that might make it happen. All of the technologies and all of the business models and all of the case studies that prove what I'm talking about already exist somewhere on the planet, and particularly in the developing countries, but not always. 
underpinning those four things I'm talking about, and I really just want to concentrate on these five here, is to say that, in fact, the shape of an organisation will resemble the dominant technology of our time. Just in the same way that organisations of the last hundred years represented the dominant technology of, the, of that time, which was, in fact, the, the, the manufacturing model. Single standard, highly distributed. So, for example, why is it that you've got different standards among you all? How, how can you be busy creating all your own standards around the place when every day you use something that depends on a common standard? Why? I don't get it. Clearly it's going to be easy to access, scalable, tough stuff. So what does this all mean? Somewhat. Well, I think there are a number of things, and I've just highlighted a few of them. Here are some things that I think uh, are truly in your province. And these are the things, in my view, that you should be designing towards. The first thing is that increasingly um, people are going to rely on their devices to navigate, not common sense. I was standing in a hotel in Kangaroo Island the other day and I was walking at the door and I ran into three young Japanese men all walking in a line following this, the, the thing on their phone. And then they said to me, where is reception? If you, have, if you have an interest in tourism in your area, if you have interest in people connecting with the businesses in your area or the, or the value or the knowledge, you're going to have to, in fact, make sure that there is a capacity to navigate. Because if people can't navigate using their devices, they're not going to want to find out from you. They just won't want to know. And a few older people go, well, you know, we don't need that. They've got the navigation in their heads, but they're the only ones. The second thing is uh, quite clearly, and uh, by the way, Victoria has a huge competitive advantage here for a little while, if it should do it, there is a capacity to tag and track everything. And no, I will not talk about the Tawong Grader ever again. But I think tagging and tracking, in fact, is huge because it will allow you to, in fact, see where resources are and see what's going on in terms of processes in ways that you have never thought about before. The third area, and I think this is significant, is crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing for me reframes um, consultation. I don't see why you should ever produce another brochure ever again, except on demand for those people that don't have um, some sort of device. So in other words, brochures should be an exception, not a rule. And this little uh, thing that you see down the bottom here, it's faded out a little bit on the screen, is actually an amphibious tank designed by the advanced weapons systems people in the States, a thing called DARPA, which is part of defence. It was crowdsourced. And yet, I'm, I'm sure not all the technical details are in there. But increasingly, we are seeing all sorts of communities of people getting together to design something that, in fact, that they want to do. So we're seeing crowdsourcing for funding, we're seeing crowdsourcing for designing things. And it strikes me that councils could easily do this with almost everything. They should crowdsource feedback to plans. They should crowdsource what new amenities should look like. And the first thing that would happen was the squeaky wheels, who you all know by name in your local communities, actually get disempowered and amen to that. And you would then be able to say with some confidence, well, look, you know, we had uh, 30,000 people actually said this rather than that. And I think that you, who are particularly those who are in the technology space, have a critical role in enabling this new kind of crowdsourcing. And you can have a depth of democratic interaction that otherwise would not be the case. But some councils will say, well, no, Mike, we don't really want that kind of consultation. We don't, we don't, we don't want to consult like that. Because, you know, you know, us councillors and managers, we, we know. We don't really want to ask people. And when I was a young man, I read a book around those lines, and it said, uh, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. 
The second area I think of focus, that, that, and this is why this particular conference excites me, is in fact uh, revitalising community. And I want to talk about the question of access. Up the top here, and I'll spend a bit of time on here, is a solution that's been built in South Africa for villages where no telco will ever go. You know, there'll never be any kind of wireless access there, and it's called mesh technology. And anyone who's been in the energy industry knows exactly what I'm talking about. And fundamentally how a mesh works is it simply creates a, net, a patchwork of any device that can connect to any other device. And they're building, using uh, tin cans and simple little devices like this, their own technology networks. And these are sprouting up all over the third world. Because people in the third world get it that you're either connected or it costs you more. And I don't want to ever hear anybody in Australia ever again say, oh, the connection in my area is hopeless. Why aren't they going to do something about it? So I'm going to argue that in those areas, particularly if you're one of two of you from rural areas, where there is no connectivity, you have a role to provide it. And of course all the libraries, which were a 19th century institution in the first place, because they were about books and printing, right, actually also become points of connectivity. And I've seen some great examples. Uh, Painesville uh, out in Gippsland is a stunning example of a little library which has just got a whole batch of uh, uh, computers and ways for people to connect free. Uh, and in my view, smart local governments in this world that we're going into will make their whole CBD wireless. You know, you, you buy one wireless licence, you make everybody contribute. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than everybody having to pay. The second thing that's going to happen, and I think again this is a challenge, is that as, this, as these old coherent uh, economies break up, we see more and more localised, self-defined solutions, and they're called micro-economies. And often they will have investments through some sort of crowdsourcing like Kickstarter. And these micro-economies will, will be new avenues for selling food, for selling shoes, for whatever. I was doing some work in Benalla the other day and I was talking to a guy from Shepparton and he said to me, he said, oh, my wife started shopping online. He says, that's cost me a fortune. He said, but now she's becoming a distributor and she's selling shoes. And he said, we thank God for that because it actually means we're getting free now. And the third area, so, so in fact, how does a local government that's been used to having housing here, industry over there, retail over there, cope with a world where in fact these little micro-economies are operating out of people's garages, out of the back of their car, uh, and little collaborations everywhere. You sure as hell can't rate them in the way that you used to. The third area, I think, in this revitalising community is to, in fact, and again, you can see the connectivity. In the world that I live in, instead of having, you know, the age of competition, we had one factory here, one factory here, one factory here, or sometimes we put up one of the, you know, those big slab side sheds that you see on the north of Melbourne all over the place? And everybody's got their own little silos. Well, there is a better way. And that's to start to think about having conversations about the people who are in fact are running these things and say, what are some of the smart things that you could be positioned next to? And here's just a really simple little example where in fact what you start to see here is a data centre that's got some heat. It's generating that heat into a greenhouse. Um, there's another greenhouse which has actually got some CO2 which is also pumping into a new greenhouse and they're also drawing some stuff off the grid. So you start to see the evolution of economic activity as if you like an ecology, like a little garden, rather than a set of little siloed soldiers all standing up in a row like they did in the American Civil War and called the British. And the third area I think that's important for me is this area of design, planning and governance. Um, this is the uh, 311 system in New York. I understand it's going to be talked about a little bit later on. 
But what you'll start to say is that using the cloud-based devices, you can bring the community in in ways that you never could before to what's going on, what's been planned, where the problems are, how it's going. And you'll start to see over here, you know, there was a rat poisoning over here, there was a mouse found in a restaurant, da -de -da -de -da, all of that kind of good stuff. The second thing I think that goes uh, along here is, and again, we see it all the time, but in this world, I think, of the cloud, we move from a world of where we counted things once a year to a world where we count things all the time. And I'm sure all of you have driven past those signs, you know, up and down the freeways around Melbourne, where you see, you know, telemarines, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I come in from the west, uh, 20 minutes from here, five hours from here, whatever it might happen to be. So it's constantly updating. So what would it look like in your council if you never ever had to count things ever again? That they were being continuously counted? And in my view, cloud-based systems really help you get access to the kinds of solutions and processes that do that. And the third area, which seems to disappear on my slide, I don't know what I've done with it, never mind. Um, is around modelling. Uh, this is where, in fact, uh, you can model uh, what a building will look like, where its shade patterns are, uh, what it looks like in three dimensions. Um, ACT government already do this kind of thing. Uh, you can model in real time. And again, the power of the networks, in fact, will allow you to do that. So the excuse we really didn't know what it would look like I think it's going to be soon not be a viable excuse. You know, every car company in the world builds their cars in virtual reality before they ever create them. By the way, they build all the machines and all the parts as well, and they check it out. Uh, they tried it with the 767, but they sort of got it right most of the time. So my argument has been this, and I'll take a couple of questions in a moment. Firstly, the world is changing whether you like it or not. And it's a new construct. And I think that the cloud, uh, the cloud computing notion, which we're going to focus on the day on today, is a key construct. But it will require many of you to behave differently than you do now. I don't think there'll be such a thing as IT departments in 10 years from now. I'm not sure what they would do. I think there will be architects, and I think there might be some small-scale systems, but generally speaking, you know, the, 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 the era of digital gods is over. What you might need to do is to think about what is the appropriate scale for you to build a cloud on. I have a personal worry that the, that the future of cloud will be defined by Google or by IBM or someone else. And that's an American model. What does a Victorian local government cloud look like? Yes, it might access some of those things, but can we give it the colour and the flavour and the, and the culture that, that should be us, not somebody else? Let, let me stop there. Um, as I say, I come from a world where I don't think this is a matter of choice. And I don't think this revolution I'm talking about is in the future. I think it's now. Are there one or two questions before I close? Sir. Uh, I guess before we get too far into the day, um, the definition of the cloud versus uh, internet, if you like, uh, as I understand it, uh, the contemporary definition of cloud is the provisioning of software and hardware on demand. Uh, In data. Uh, 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 the answer for me is point, yeah. point connections between uh, you know, remote systems, for example. Um, the, the answer for me is, in a way, all of those kinds of things that you're talking about. Where is that one? That one there. Um, I, I, think for, I think for me that the key thing in the cloud based uh, thing is the access to software uh, on demand as opposed to having to buy it. Okay, software and services and solutions that go along with that. Um, Salesforce is a really good example of a cloud-based 
client tracking system that a lot of SMEs use, for example. Uh, very, very smart, logs all the calls, does all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that the other thing that's really critical here though, and this is, this is a personal story, is in fact when you actually put your data out there. Um, I had the misfortune, I was coming to one of these things one day, I rushed and I dropped my, I'm an Apple geek, I dropped my Apple computer in at the shop and said to them, stick the new software on it. At the end of the meeting I had this meeting saying, oh terribly sorry, sorry we actually um, uh, wiped all the data off your computer, I hope you backed it up. And I sort of had, but I lost a whole quarter's worth of data, which I hadn't backed up because I'm slack. And I resolved to myself, I will never do that to myself again. So I now have a, a cloud-based system, Dropbox, cost me $100 a year. I have a copy of everything that I produce in that cloud. By the way, I have one special file in there, which has, which has got a little encryption on the front of it. So if it is super sensitive, and I have one or two super sensitive clients, then I can put that in there and good luck if you can break it. But you'd struggle. So, so it is, what that means though is that when I come to something like this, I know that if my, if all of a sudden, because I get up very early in the morning because I live in Torquay, um, I know that if in fact all of a sudden I haven't got my flash drive with a presentation on it, I can access it on my iPad, I can talk to whoever the local provider is and I can actually access it on the cloud and send it to them an email without trying. Another example I've got right now, I'm actually writing another thesis at the moment which is looking at the rise and fall of civilizations. I won't bore you with it, but it's called Macro History. I've got a copy on my computer and because this is taking me forever, I'm keeping a copy on the cloud as well because I am dead scared of losing it. Dead scared. So I've got I've got, actually got three copies, so I'm creating some redundancy in there, but it's a lot easier than me continuing to invest in miles and miles and miles of, of data. So that's what cloud is for me. But look, you're going to see a number of people talk a little bit more about it. So, it's, so for me, it's not just it's out there, but it's the capacity to access it whenever I need it. You know, why don't building inspectors have an iPad? You know, and go and see a building, they've got all the approvals there, be able to do all the right things there and say, oh, yeah, look, I'm going to pass that, or here, you know, here are the things, watch your email, I'll give it to you right now, and then walk to the next job. That's what a good cloud system would do. And that means that you're going to deliver far more value using far fewer resources. I mean, sometimes a guy might say, look, I want to think about this, I want to go back to my office. Of course they do. So I'm not, please don't all rush and say it's going to be this or, or that, but it's a shift that's going on. Just like we still have steam engines, it's the shift that matters, not just the destination. Right, thank you. Anything else? One more before I finish, because John's getting all antsy with me. No? Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, yes, sir? What do you feel is the biggest obstacle in uh, this uptake of cloud technology? Is it the loss of control of the data or the lack of understanding? It seems that there's a big push for it, but the uptake is... That's because in the 20th century, we were brought up in a world which said knowledge is power and I will share it with you on my conditions in my time. In the 21st century, knowledge is collaboration and I will share it with you as soon as I can, when I can, so we can in fact produce something better together. That's the shift that councils have to make. So, uh, and we had a little discussion about this before I started this morning, I'm grateful to some of my colleagues. Uh, my view is that if your councillors and senior managers do not understand the shift that I'm talking about here, do not understand that for many councils this is a better place than being a failed whatever under the old system, then all of the, you know, the te technology advocacy will just go over their heads. So the reason why John got me here, I think, at least I hope that's why he got me here, I'm kind of looking at him out of the corner of my eye, is because, in fact, you need to understand the shift in context and the opportunity it brings first. And that gives you then, uh, as technology experts, the audience to actually understand the things that you're trying to advocate. 
But thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I hope that that's all made sense to you.